Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Toby Heaps. I'm the CEO of Corporate Nights. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in a five-part series of the Ottawa Climate Talks, Building Back Better Together. If the joke um, has, is that hydrogen's the, the future fuel, and it, it always will be, but I think that's a little unfair now, just given that it's already a $100 billion market, and there are many credible projections for it to reach a trillion uh, euro market by the end of this coming decade, this decade that we're in by 2030. The Europeans are looking at potential capex into the mostly green hydrogen space of close to half a trillion. So it's it's a it's definitely a place where there's action. The three questions, um, some of which we'll get to today, yeah, are you know, do we have a right to play in the hydrogen space from from Canada, and if if we do have a right to play, what are the table stakes? Our initial analysis suggests something in the neighborhood of about a billion dollars of public money for R and D, and then another eight. To 10 billion for crowding and in investment for deployment uh, if we're going to be serious and we do have a right to play and then the third question is how do we make sure if we do win the prize that a lot of the prize gets to stay here in canada because often the story of our industrial strategy is we can win but then most of the capital gains and dividends um, and even tax benefits flow outside of our nation and so those are three questions we'll be touching on those and others um, and the, one of the men of the hour people of the hour is minister uh, Seamus O'Regan, who is overseeing this file, coming up with Canada's strategy for hydrogen. And so it's my uh, honor to um, pass it to Minister. Uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Thanks, Toby. Um, thank you, Your Excellency and, and uh, Diana and everyone at Corporate Nights for making this possible. Um, it's great to be back with you. I'm joining you once again from the island of Newfoundland, the ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq and the Beothuk. And, uh, and also a place that um, uh, when, when we did have a direct flight from, uh, from St. John's to Heathrow, uh, three hours and 55 minutes uh, from, from St. John's to Heathrow. It was, uh, it was great because I spent three years in Europe um, uh, at three different universities and eventually at least got one degree out of it. Um, uh, but just to give you an idea of Newfoundland's proximity to Europe, it's three hours, 55 minutes by 767. And it's three and a half hours to Toronto. So we are a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic very much. Um, when I spoke to you the last time we talked about Canada's clean energy future and, and, and getting, in, getting there in a way that was smart and thoughtful and thorough. This is something I, I wax on about, about you know, three points, about how we need to be smart enough to keep finding the solutions uh, that make our traditional sources of energy more sustainable than ever. Um, and we do that through evolving in new clean technologies. It's the innovation space, it's the ingenuity space. Secondly, about how we, how we can be thorough enough to ensure that we don't overlook the solutions that are right under our noses. And top of mind for me there is you know, things like retrofits, um, which I'm big on. Um, and and how, how we can be thoughtful enough to ensure that people, energy workers and their families aren't left behind. Um, not only because we're Canadian and we don't leave people behind, but, um, but also because their, their expertise and their experience are exactly what we need in order to make the transition uh, that we need to get, that we need to do in order to lower emissions on a great scale. Um, increasingly, I believe a hydrogen has the potential to answer those important questions. Um, reaching that clean energy future will be the challenge and the opportunity of our post-COVID recovery. It is the surest way to strengthen our economic competitiveness and create good, sustainable jobs for Canadians. I sound, uh, I sound like President-elect Biden here, who always brings us back to jobs. Um, the way we produce, move, and use energy accounts for over 80% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions, as you know. And, and the question and the challenge for us is how do we shrink that number? How do we meet our needs? How do we power our cities? How do we power our towns? How do we heat our homes? How do we grow our economy while producing fewer emissions? Um, you know, these questions are difficult, all of them together, um, but they are the ones that we need to answer. Uh, fortunately, energy is amongst Canada's greatest strengths. Uh, not to oversimplify, but uh, as my late friend Jim Prentice used to say, energy is our family business. Is something that we're really good at. And at this moment, around the world, investors are making clear choices like we have never seen before. 
They are putting their money into businesses, industries, and jurisdictions that are meaningfully combating climate change. And they are divesting away from those that aren't, uh, at least in their view. They are divesting from those that in their view are not taking action. The markets are moving. And if Canada is going to continue to prosper, we've got to skate to where the puck is going. Hydrogen is where the puck is going. I mean, look, I'm old enough that I can still remember Expo 86 and traveling around Vancouver in a hydrogen bus. Uh, you know, as Toby joked earlier, uh, hydrogen is the future and it always will be. Um, we know the road to this moment for hydrogen has been a long one. Um, but that's, I think, what makes it all the more exciting because the story of hydrogen in many ways is a Canadian one. We have a well-earned reputation for ingenuity in this space. Um, name any country where hydrogen is being deployed in a significant way and Canadian know-how and technology is a part of it. I, I was having a completely unrelated conversation with uh, the Danish ambassador uh, about three months ago and she just brought up uh, that uh, the, the buses that go around the University of Copenhagen are powered by, uh, by Ballard. Um, the irony is that our biggest challenge is duplicating that success at home. Uh, we, we simply have not reached a critical mass. We don't have enough large-scale hydrogen projects here in Canada. We are going to change that soon uh, with the unveiling of a, our hydrogen, hydrogen strategy for Canada. Um, I don't want to scoop myself, um, having been a reporter, that's just not what you do, and especially after, you know, so close to what's been a three-year effort. Uh, but I will say this, and it, and it should come as no surprise, Canada can lead globally on hydrogen. We are a vast country, and when it comes to producing hydrogen, we have distinct regional advantages right across the country. So in order to leverage these advantages, we are focusing on the em emissions intensity of hydrogen. The color coding of hydrogen pathways has served, I think, as an early differentiator. But as the talk around hydrogen becomes increasingly sophisticated, I think a standardized measure of emissions intensity of hydrogen will be more effective. Regardless of the production pathway, whether it's blue, green, pink, um, we have the experience, we have the expertise, and we have and the commitment to produce the lowest carbon intensity hydrogen possible. And in Alberta and Saskatchewan, we can capitalize on our natural gas sectors to produce hydrogen with the help of world leading CCUS technologies. Uh, in Canada's north, hydrogen and other low carbon fuels offer some opportunities to reduce diesel dependency there. Um, giving largely indigenous remote northern communities access to clean energy. BC, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec will be able to use waste aversion for increased renewable natural gas, uh, natural gas production and, and leverage low cost hydropower for large scale clean hydrogen production. And here in my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, we can leverage the extra electricity that we produce alongside wind and other renewables for clean hydrogen production. We also here, as I pointed out earlier, have proximity to European markets, just as BC enjoys proximity to Asia. Achieving all of this requires us to be ambitious with, um, with actions required across the hydrogen value chain to make supply and demand grow at the same pace. There's work to be done, but the payoff will be a game changer. According to the latest estimates, global production of hydrogen will increase at least tenfold in the coming decades accounting for close to a quarter of all the energy used around the world by 2050 and creating an industry valued at as much as $11.7 trillion. We will lead this market. We can transform almost every part of our economy, expand our exports, create good jobs, and generate new opportunities in every corner of the country. A thriving Canadian hydrogen sector could create as many as 350,000 jobs in everything from R&D to manufacturing in the service sector. And clean hydrogen could reduce our annual greenhouse gas emissions by up to 190 megatons a year. That is about a quarter of our expected emissions in 2050. So let me end where I began, an energy future that is smart, thorough, and thoughtful. That is exactly what this work will accomplish. And we are doubling down on our common mission, a net zero economy by 2050, a global economy that continues to grow and prosper and an energy future that leaves no one behind. I believe our moment has come, the world is watching 
and Canada will lead. Thank you. I, I wish I could stay for your deliberations, I, but have no fear. I will be getting a full report and I look forward to it. This is a, a great room and this is exactly the kind of room that will get it done. Thank you very much, Toby, and thank you to you all. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Thank you for being with us and for that really optimistic, upbeat uh, projections around hydrogen. We look forward to the strategy coming out uh, very soon. So thank you for that. And now I'm going to move on to our panel. I'm going to introduce the panelists. And then uh, unlike most of our events, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a background just to bring everyone up to speed on some of the hydrogen terminology before we get into the debate. So today we are very fortunate to have with us two colleagues from Germany. We have Stefan Kaufmann, who is the commissioner of, of the Federal Republic of Germany's green hydrogen strategy. And uh, he's joining us actually from Namibia. Um, so we're lucky to have him. We have Raffaele Piria, who is senior advisor and co-lead for energy at Adelphi. We had one of his colleagues on a previous event. Adelphi is a think tank in Berlin. And here in Canada, we have Sarah Petrovan, who is the policy director of Clean Energy Canada, and Beva Paul, who is the founder of Senti Innovations. It's a fantastic panel. But after this panel, if you stay on from 12 till 1, we're having a special session hosted by Plug and Play Supply Chain and Logistics, moderated by Marcello Lu, who you will know from last week and previous ones of our events. He's president of BASF Canada, and he's going to be talking with uh, four companies who are innovating in the green hydrogen space. So if you want to get practical, that's next hour. Please stay with us. Uh, for now, we're going to talk about some of the uh, see and other angles around hydrogen. And the minister already alluded to the fact that hydrogen, there's much potential around hydrogen. If we are going to achieve our net zero greenhouse gas by 2050 target, which we uh, have made, we need to do many things. We need massive electrification. We need to deploy negative uh, technologies, um, negative carbon technologies. And we need to find solutions that are zero carbon for very difficult problems, so difficult parts of the economy, so as, such as powering heavy transport, heating some homes, providing uh, intensive point source heat for industry, um, and providing uh, transport fuel for ships and um, airplanes, perhaps. So hydrogen seems to fit the bill in this space. It, it, it emits only water when it's burned, um, and it can fill, fulfill many of those usages that I've mentioned. However, it's not a magic bullet. We've got a lot of work to do. And the key issues are around cost, the cost of producing it, of the electrolysis that produces it, um, or the, the, the reformation of methane, uh, and the cost of transporting it. Uh, it can be transported as a gas, but it's very easy to, uh, it escapes very readily, it's hot, it's bulky, or it can be transported as, um, in another form, so uh, as ammonia, for example, but uh, that has other issues associated. So technologically, there are challenges of how we reduce the costs in all parts of the hydrogen chain. You will have heard, and the minister also referred to the issue of uh, the different colors of hydrogen. We have gray hydrogen, which is produced from uh, fossil fuels. That's not what we're talking about today. We have blue hydrogen, um, which is also produced from fossil fuels, but with uh, carbon capture. So that theoretically can be uh, can approach zero carbon. Uh, there is a concern that it's unlikely to get to zero carbon because of the cost of, of catching the last emission and also the, the potential for methane leaks during the process. And then there's green hydrogen, which is the best quality. It's, it's the hydrogen you'd want if we could have it. Um, uh, it's very easy to use, uh, very pure. Um, but, and that's produced using you know, electrolysis, using renewable energy. So it's truly zero carbon, um, but it's a very intensive in terms of its energy use. So about 80% of the cost of green hydrogen is the cost of energy. So the, 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 the future of renewable energy and hydrogen are very closely linked, uh, both on the supply side, um, because we need that renewable energy to produce the hydrogen, but also there is a symbiotic relationship and one of the big potential uses for hydrogen is to uh, balance a renewable grid. So to store excess energy when um, it's produced, uh, when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining um, and uh, also to, to, to fill in the gaps when that's not happening. So there's, there's, a, good, um, there's a good possibility in that space. Um, we have, uh, 
as I say, that one of the big issue, issues is um, around cost uh, and the EU hydrogen strategy that, 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 that's been released uh, hopes to drive down the cost uh, by about half of green hydrogen over the coming years. And we can get back to that later on. OK, so that's the sort of background. Hope that's enough for most people. Um, there's been a huge upsurge in interest in hydrogen over the past 12 to 18 months. Chris, if you could show the slide um, uh, that we have, which uh, is just a list of all the countries that have either talked about uh, developing a hyd hydrogen strategy or have committed funds in the area. Um, you'll see this. So we have our draft is coming out. The minister was very upbeat about that. We're entering a crowded field. We do have advantages. We're ahead of the game. We have uh, you know, been working on, Ballard has been working on fuel cells for many decades, for example. But let's start in Germany. We have Germany that has a plan and, and 9 billion euros committed uh, to the sector. And as I say, we're fortunate uh, to have Germany's Green Hydrogen Commissioner with us today. So Stefan, can you start by giving us a brief uh, summary of the approach that your country is taking in this space? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Diane. So uh, we launched our the national hydrogen strategy in June this year, uh, because for us, is, uh, green hydrogen is the uh, sustainable um, is the key to a sustainable economy and society. Um, and uh, we have to decarbonize, as all other countries as well, uh, under the. Um, Paris uh, agreement, and that means for Germany, uh, 750 millions of tons of CO2 less in 2050. And for example, the steel industry in Germany emits uh, uh, 70, uh, 70 million T CO2 every year. Um, and uh, that's the first point. Uh, we have to decarbonize our industry, and we have to find uh, possibilities to store the uh, the, um, the, the renewable energy, which is uh, more than we can use at the moment. There, therefore, you, you talked about it. Uh, hydrogen is very uh, good. You can store it in vessels, you can store it in pipelines, you can store it in, in caverns or uh, uh, in, in other um, substitutes. And then uh, there are a lot of um, um, things we can't do with battery electricity. Uh, for example, planes or big ships or trains, or also trucks. And also here we need uh, the fuel cell technology and we need a uh, hydrogen and uh, that's the reason why we launched our strategy in june and um, we um, address it uh, to four ministries which are in uh, uh, we, which are responsible for the for the strategy uh, we uh, have uh, nine billion euros for the um, for the um, to, to 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 make it uh, to yeah, how to say to um, Yes, to bring it in the in the in the world. Um, I'm, I'm lacking the word, sorry. Uh, so, which means seven million for the industry for the value chain, which means uh, build up uh, uh, in, in a in a big scale uh, the production of green hydrogen. Therefore, we need also a lot of much more renewable energy capacities. And then we look on the transport side, and we also look on the uh, on the demand side, which means at first. Uh, the steel and the chemistry industry, where we have the very big uh, em emissions, and also aluminium industry, for example, um, but also uh, the fuel cell technology, for example, in the truck sector. So uh, we build up a national uh, advisory council, um, and there's also a council of the state secretary for the governance of the uh, for the strategy. So that's a very brief uh, <laughs> for that what we are doing, and uh, the money has to be spent in the next uh, three to four years uh, because. Um, it's to um, push the economy in COVID times. And so we are really looking for very concrete projects now in uh, 100, 200, 300 megawatt uh, um, 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 building up actualized cap capacities with German firms. And we know that we have to import uh, up to 80% of the green hydrogen we need. So that's why we're building up now um, corporations all over the world. That's why I'm in Namibia now. Uh, for example, that's why you have a feasibility study with Australia, and that's why we hope to cooperate also uh, with Canada, which is a very interesting country. You are uh, expert in energy, and uh, you have a very strong commitment of the government, as we heard from the minister a few minutes ago. Thank you so much. Uh, that's good. I mean, it's, it's nice to hear that there's cooperation, not just competition between nations.
Raffaele, you're based in Berlin, um, so your thoughts on the on the Germany strategy would be very welcome. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Germany is doubling down on the green hydrogen space, uh, not necessarily the the blue, the sort of transitional hydrogen one might think of it. I just want to put a, a chart up here now, Chris. If you'd put up the cost chart that we have, which is uh, these these are from Sarah's organization, but uh, from her recent report. Uh, but from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the data. And this is uh, um, a projection of the cost of green and blue hydrogen. So at the moment you see the green is, is, is high relative to the blue uh, cost, but that blue cost doesn't shift much over the next uh, 30 years, whereas the green is uh, projected to uh, more, than, more than half um, if we get things right over the next 30 years. Now, the minister said we, we should really talk about zero carbon hydrogen and the blue green is, is a diversion. People have different opinions on this. Raffaele, can you um, give us your opinion on what you think of the you know, Germany stance and what the relative efforts should be on blue and green? Thank you, Diana, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Well, uh, Bloomberg might be a bit on the optimistic side on, the, on cost development um, of green hydrogen. However, I would like to make three points which are based more on fundamentals and less on um, assumptions that may be right or wrong. But it's very clear green hydrogen costs will go down, will go down significantly, hopefully very quickly. And um, uh, my first point is that we don't really need much hydrogen to achieve 70 or 80 percent uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, Germany achieved 40 percent uh, without hydrogen. We need it for the last 20%, and that's a tough part. And because now we want to have uh, climate neutrality, and that's a shared goal of Canada, Germany, many other nations, that's why we are talking hydrogen. The point with blue hydrogen is that uh, after carbon capture, after carbon capture, according to the IA, uh, still uh, 10 to 44% of the CO2 emissions are released in the atmosphere, and probably often rather in the 20% side. And even worse, there are methane emissions. And ethane is a very aggressive climate gas. And methane emissions are strongly underestimated. In the future, they will be better monitored by satellites. And uh, um, so it's difficult to see how gas plus CCS can lead to zero emission. In the long term, we need green hydrogen. That's clear. And that's why the EU's and Germany's hydrogen strategies, and I guess also those of other uh, U European countries, are clearly focusing on green hydrogen. That's what we need in the long term. Of course, blue hydrogen is desirable uh, if it's the only possible alternative to gray. So if the alternative is uh, gas without any kind of CCS, then we should put CCS on it. And uh, this is uh, might be play a role for uh, to meet the current existing demand for hydrogen or new demand that we might create. So if a steel maker like in Germany, for example, wants this decides to switch to hydrogen, its demand will have to be matched with gray, blue, or, uh, or, or possibly green hydrogen. If green hydrogen isn't available at scale, then uh, it might be uh, reasonable, it will be reasonable to feed this steel making process with green hydrogen. However, in the next 10 or 15 years, demand will not increase uh, as massively as some people seem to think. And uh, actually it should also decrease because most of hydrogen is consumed in oil refineries today. And we want to shut them down. Let's be clear. Climate neutrality means that uh, almost all oil refineries will have to be shut down in the next decades. That's what we are talking about. And this will reduce demand of hydrogen. So third, the last point in reality, I think uh, the, the crucial point is uh, emission intensity, CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of hydrogen. And maybe it's not a question of clear cut colors, gray and blue are a mix actually. And even green, if you still have uh, coal in the power mix, in the first time it will not be completely green, it will be green gray. So what we will need is a certification system that shows the life cycle emission intensity of hydrogen production. And uh, these will make clear how blue blue hydrogen really is and how attractive it really is. I think it is in general, uh, I strongly doubt that it is worth to make billions of euros or dollars of investments 
in uh, CCS processes if uh, in 10 years or 15 years green hydrogen will be more attractive from an economic point of view. Thank you. That answers that we had a question in, in, in the chat window that says, why, why, why would we bother going for blue if, you know, the best solution is green? Why don't we get to green uh, sooner by putting more effort into it? I think you, you answered that. You alluded to um, a number of issues, one of which is the market, the sort of chicken and egg problem over markets. How do we develop the market so that we have the investment in the hydrogen and which comes first, demand or supply? And I'd like to get back to that uh, soon, but I'd like to now bring in Sarah. Um, Sarah, your uh, organization has written a recent report on uh, the hydrogen economy. I know you have certain thoughts on the blue-green debate, but can you just uh, explain how you uh, see hydrogen fitting into Canada's energy future and where you think, if you were uh, advising the minister, where would you say he, we in Canada should be putting our greatest efforts at this COVID time? Thanks, Diana. So on the blue green hydrogen debate, we argue and I would argue that conversations around blue and green don't get at the problem that we're really trying to solve, which is emissions intensity and a reduction in emissions. And so the point about hydrogen and the point about all of this about fighting climate change is to reduce emissions intensity over time. And so that should be the focus of the hydrogen debate. What helps us reduce emissions. And so the focus should be not necessarily on colors, but on emissions intensity. For Canada, you know, as Raphael was saying, um, hydrogen has a unique role to play in certain sectors and, and some sectors more than others. So in Canada, you know, we call it uh, the toughest third of emissions to abate. What sectors are these? These are heavy industry, uh, you know, Raphael mentioned steel also could be used in uh, cement. We talk about marine, we talk about aviation, uh, perhaps uh, in some instances, uh, long haul freight. These are the ideal places uh, for hydrogen to be used and distributed over the long term. Thank you. And where would you be thinking about investing uh, to support technology development. Are you more concerned about production or about the distribution network for hydrogen? So the thing is, is that you have to, when you're, when you're, when government is considering, government policymakers are considering how to support hydrogen and you could, Canada could look to how Germany has uh, chosen to make their interventions as an example of one to follow. That you have to, you have to scale up both the supply and the demand side and move them in in equal tandem. There's a lot of conversation about the opportunity for Canada to increase supply of hydrogen, you know, whether it be blue, whether it be green, but there is less of a conversation about what Canada is going to do to stimulate demand. And that demand is not present currently in terms of international global markets. So that demand, something's going to have to be done to help stimulate demand domestically while we're waiting for international markets to mature. Thank you. I'd like to now turn to uh, Beaver Paul. Uh, you've got a slightly different perspective on this. You're thinking about bringing better energy options to indigenous communities. And the minister also referenced that this, this is an important opportunity and a need for Canada. Can you explain uh, your thinking on hydrogen, how it can help the communities you're working with and what you would like to see government uh, do to support your efforts? Well, uh, thank you for inviting uh, uh, Senti Environmental Service and Innovations uh, to the panel. And I'm very pleased to uh, represent Senti uh, Innovations. With respect to indigenous communities, uh, hydrogen will play a key role going into the future, especially in Northern communities. I am Wollastaway and I am uh, uh, living uh, in the Gaspar Sea uh, amongst the Mi'kmaq and uh, we have been focusing on uh, uh, renewable energy since 2007. Um, we have a huge cement plant on our territory, the largest emitter of CO2 in Quebec. We have to do something about that. And uh, what we've done is that uh, we've uh, offered them uh, green ammonia and with the cooperation of our uh, engineering partners in uh, Netherlands, uh, we have uh, designed 
a small scale ammonia plant to do that. After doing this work, and we had also built a 150 megawatt uh, wind farm on our territory, half of which we own. And all this is done through partnerships. And uh, while we can help other communities, especially Northern communities, is by uh, introdu introducing renewable energy into our communities that respects our principle, which is all right? Which means that uh, we have the right to access any of the resources, but we can only take what we need. We have to leave uh, enough resources for the future communities. That said, uh, hydrogen, as we uh, see it, uh, can replace diesel. We can uh, replace diesel in our communities. We have uh, a large uh, uh, fleet of uh, uh, fishing vessels. We can replace our diesel uh, engines with uh, fuel cells or with uh, internal combustion engines that use ammonia as a fuel. So uh, we also believe that when we use uh, hydrogen to produce ammonia, we have an environmentally sustainable energy source. That said, with renewable energy power plants in remote communities, we can uh, improve the energy security. That means that we produce the energy locally and we store it with ammonia. And uh, that said, uh, we also create our own wealth, all right? And our wealth, uh, for example, with the Mesquite Fusion Wind Farm that we built in our uh, community, that will produce $225 million of profits over a 20 year period. That's a significant impact. And with that, we will uh, invest in uh, community infrastructure, language, education. So uh, that said, for Northern communities as well, we look at uh, food security. Once we have energy security, we can then move to food security, hydroponics, aquaculture, those, are the impacts of hydrogen. We're excited about it. We're doing something about it. And I really enjoy uh, the minister's comments. Uh, I think that they, uh, they will resonate well in the, in the minds of our, our, uh, our members. So uh, yeah, that's uh, short. And what do we, uh, and what government needs to do? They need to help us de-risk, all right, our investments. The first million is always the hardest. And I know this from working on wind farm uh, projects uh, amongst the uh, Maliseet yeah. and amongst the Mi'kmaq. And uh, both those projects will change those communities. So there is um, the need to de-risk investments and that can come in different ways. And the other thing is that we need partnerships, all right? That uh, the uh, federal and provincial governments need to support partnerships because we're not all engineers and we're not all uh, uh, investors, but, uh, working together, we can achieve uh, some of the things that we've already done in other communities. So uh, hopefully that's, uh, uh, that's helpful. Thank you, Biva. I think okay. that, that, that's uh, an excellent um, overview of the kind of opportunities mm -hmm. there are and, and the needs there are in your space. So we've, we've talked about a range of things. Um, coming back to Germany and Canada, we, some of the opportunities are similar and some are different. I think Canada is thinking about being a producer of hydrogen and a user of hydrogen, whereas Germany, as the commission mentioned, will always, will produce, but will always need to import a good deal of the green hydrogen. Um, so perhaps is focusing more on stimulating the uh, demand for that hydrogen domestically. Um, can you, um, Stefan, can you just explain to us a little bit more about the end uses uh, that you're really focused on in Germany? You mentioned heavy, heavy industry. Obviously, there are cost issues around, for example, producing steel using hydrogen. Um, it, it is considerably more expensive um, at, at this point in time. How are you thinking about stimulating the different segments of the market that would, would create the demand for uh, zero emission? Let's call it zero emission hydrogen now. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, let me first say one sentence to the blue uh, hydrogen. Uh, I see it, um, as it was said, uh, we need it for the transition time for the next maybe five to 10 years. 
uh, but there are also problems and it's cost intensive also to capture the CO2 and to build up structures to store it then. And uh, that's why we won't produce uh, blue hydrogen in Germany, but uh, there's a market for blue hydrogen, the Norway, the Norwegians and the Dutch, they will sell it on the market. And uh, so we will use it to decarbonize that was what was said. Uh, on the demand side, uh, yes, we focus at first uh, also with the billions, uh, the steel, the heavy industries, especially the steel industry. We have um, um, uh, technical possibilities to change uh, the heating from uh, ovens, uh, from coal um, or cokes to, to green hydrogen or to hydrogen, um, but it costs uh, 1 billion per oven. And uh, so we have in Germany investment costs uh, for the whole steel industry from around 30 billion uh, euros. Um, and we will help, uh, we have uh, four big steel companies in Germany producing, and we will uh, make some project with them and help them also on the CapEx side. Uh, but what is more needed is uh, to become the uh, hydrogen cheaper. And that's why we also think about regulation, like regulatory issues. We are, um, um, are now um, changing before the next elections, uh, the renewable energy law to make the energy which is used to produce green hydrogen uh, cheaper. That is uh, what we're discussing now in the parliament. Um, um, that, that's the one point. So steel and cement industry and also aluminum uh, and then the chemistry industry, they are big users, but they're also producing uh, hydrogen and they're also using gray hydrogen um, for their processes. So we have to find solutions here. And then on the demand side, uh, we talked about the aviation sector, which is very, very important in, in Germany. You know, uh, our OEMs, the big uh, um, uh, automotive companies. Um, so that's why we have a big discussion at the moment about uh, synthetic fuels, uh, green fuels. Um, but uh, for, the, for the first step, we will, um, we will um, focus on green uh, kerosene because um, in the aviation sector, we have no, we have no other possibility than uh, uh, than the fuel cell uh, um, engines than in maybe uh, 15 years. And in the meantime, we need green hydrogen, uh, a green uh, kerosene. Uh, that's why we focus that. And then we focus on the truck, uh, um, on the heavy truck and the long truck, uh, distance trucks. We focus on the ship industry, uh, also on the, on the um, uh, train industry, um, but not so much uh, on the individual uh, uh, um, um, car industry. That's uh, but it's a discussion in Germany because uh, you know we have a little transition from the diesel engines to the uh, battery uh, um, and electricity engines now and then to the fuel cell um, um, to the fuel cell. Uh, by the way, there was a, a, a cooperation for ten years funded by my ministry between Canada and uh, Germany via Daimler in the fuel cell technology um, um, in automotive sector. So that, that could be a good uh, part for uh, also further cooperation. Stefan, just a quick follow up. Uh, can we just, you just give us a one minute on how you're communicating this strategy to the public and what the public profile of, of green hydrogen is in your country? Yeah, there's a very big, uh, we have this national uh, uh, council I talked about with 25 experts from industry, but also from activists from Greenpeace, for example. Uh, so um, um, we have a big discussion. Uh, we have a lot of local initiatives uh, organized by city, by communities, organized by companies, uh, by, uh, by, the, um, by the economic chambers, for example. So um, there's a very big um, um, discussion also, not only with the big uh, companies, but also on the local levels. Uh, cities uh, try to produce uh, green hydrogen with an electrolyzer, with a small uh, windmill, and um, to run uh, buses uh, for the local traffic uh, with, uh, with fuel cells, for example. So there's a lot of discussions uh, going on. And the problem is a bit on, on the, the, the natural strategy with its seven billions plus the two billions for international corporations is focusing more on the on the big uh, picture on the demand side and on the supply side and not so much on such local projects and that's what i'm also trying to bring in the discussion now and also to help such small initiatives to bring it also to the people uh, so that they feel uh, also the people on the street and in the cities that green hydrogen is something to change our future thank you thank you Let's turn back now to uh, to, to Canada, uh, uh, Sarah. Perhaps you can 
tell us a little bit uh, about what you think uh, we should be doing uh, in terms of uh, thinking about this as an export market or a domestic solution uh, for Canada and where you think the real opportunities lie for Canada. So, I mean, we know that Canada has been thinking about a hydrogen strategy for some time. The minister gave us some context to kick off this discussion, and we still don't yet know what Canada's plans are. And of course, we're anxiously awaiting them. You know, the, the challenge with hydrogen, I find both in, you know, the Canadian context and in perhaps in some in some international discussions is that there's always the risk of looking at hydrogen as with any other technology as a panacea, something that is going to solve all problems and, you know, be, be the one size fits all solution. And I think, you know, that's something that we need to be really careful about in Canada. And that was also backed up by some interesting research done out of Harvard University that looked at, you know, various different countries um, and what, what sort of ingredients they have and who would be primed to lead if, if and when export markets ever develop around hydrogen, you know, which, um, you know, they're, they're suggesting will happen closer to 2040 uh, than perhaps, you know, 2025 or 2030. So one of the things that they said about Canada was that Canada is uniquely positioned in that we're geographically blessed. Uh, we have ports on either sides of the country. We're also geographically blessed in that we have uh, an abundance of clean electricity supported by hydropower and other forms of, uh, of clean energy. And so that you know, positions Canada to be among the top nations with opportunity to export hydrogen if and when that opportunity develops. So I just think it's important to kind of just put that, put, put the export conversation into context. And then again, you know, I revert back to, you know, where, where could hydrogen be used and deployed domestically? I refer back to, you know, the comments around uh, the toughest third of emissions to, to abate domestically. And of course, you know, we talk about hydrogen also potentially as being useful as an energy storage solution uh, to, help, um, to help us deal with um, the intermittency of renewables. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think that's that's a that's a sort of good caution. I think overriding this whole conversation, we have to bring ourselves back to the idea that you know we're in an emergency. We need to do absolutely everything to reduce that we can do to reduce emissions across the board. Hydrogen will be, uh, it seems, part of the solution. Will have to be part of the solution, but we can't forget about everything else. And we do have to, you know, we basically have to do everything all at once, all, you know, these days. Anyway, I wanted to just, um, I'm going to come back to Beaver and talk a little bit about his communities. But Raffaele, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the, how you think this, this potential hydrogen economy might shift the balance between nations and the degree to which you see this as, as, as a collaborative space versus a competitive space. Uh, also, there's a question about whether the European play in hydrogen was a way to squeeze out the Russians and, and, and their LNG exports and things like that. How do you see this whole, the geopolitics of hydrogen, if you like? Well, um... This uh, connecting to Sarah's, uh, if and when uh, the, the EU's and and the EU commitment to climate neutrality uh, implies a, a, a clear prospect that uh, Europe will import large amounts of hydrogen or hydrogen-based molecules, and that's uh, because Germany and Italy and other large European countries and also smaller countries are massively dependent from fossil fuel energy imports. And even if we expand renewables in Germany and in the EU uh, massively, there still will be need for energy imports. And we are committing to import um, energy, uh, climate neutral energy. So that's not a question of, uh, if, you, if you think that uh, the EU will stick to its climate commitments, and it did so far. So uh, actually, we are quite credible on that. Um, uh, uh, the, there will be imports. Uh, from where? In which form? Because of course, uh, Europe can also import electricity directly from Northern Africa. 
or closer neighbors. Uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, there will be a market for uh, uh, zero emission hydrogen imports. Eastern Canada has a huge, um, huge potential for additional renewable electricity generation. So also for hydrogen production. And I see that uh, uh, business could arise more in general. Of course, this also means that it, it will mean uh, climate policy, if we take it seriously, means a huge, uh, a, a huge reshape of, of the global economy and also of energy flows and also of geopolitics. Fossil fuels have been at the center of geopolitics for over a century. How many wars we fought, were fought for them? And they should disappear. That's what we are saying, or almost completely disappear. Some with CCS still, but basically disappear. And other countries with huge, um, with large and cheap renewable energy potential, or other regions like Eastern Canada, uh, will become the Middle East of the future. Uh, and also the Middle East has huge resources. So we will see a lot of changes. And I think uh, uh, this is a way, an area, one of the several areas on energy where Canada and Germany can and should collaborate more, uh, um, more, even more in the future. And that's what uh, was also announced by Ambassador Dion in uh, Berlin last week, and uh, that uh, this collaboration will probably be formalized in the near future. Thank you. Uh, that's good. I'm glad to be here at the beginning of the, the uh, cooperation between the nations. Biva, let me turn to you now. You're, you're kind of doing this, so you have a practical side. You mentioned the need for de-risking of the projects. Uh, can you just explain to us, in your world, do you feel like which areas of technology do you feel there is the greatest need for work on and which you know, to what degree is this an investment, uh, a question of the cost of capital and de-risking the, the, de the investments? And the, se the second part of my question, I guess, is you said you mentioned you had a collaboration with a Dutch company. Um, do you have uh, any relationships with German companies? Are you doing, you know, how, how do you develop that kind of collaboration around technology? With respect to uh, uh, our partnership, uh, we are working with uh, Proton Ventures. They're uh, one of our partners in uh, Spenti Innovations. And uh, in the development of our uh, micro, uh, 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 micro ammonia plant, we have used a, a consortium of um, firms in Europe, uh, Casali and others, and uh, Siemens. And so uh, we're very much in touch with uh, um, some of the companies uh, in Europe. And, Siemens is a German company, right? So um, then uh, go back to the first question again in the Northern communities. Uh, sorry, I was asking about the, oh, the, the, relative, yeah, the sort of technology versus the financial side of uh, what you're doing. Yeah, um, now with respect to the investments, um, we, are, uh, we are using a, a mature technology. It's just that we are uh, assembling it differently for a small scale. Um, and then when we try to reduce our ammonia reactor, um, there are uh, limitations and some uh, engineering challenges that add to the cost. So uh, we've completed our feed study uh, for the uh, uh, Senti uh, green ammonia plant. And uh, what we found is that the capex uh, needs to be reduced by 50% and the electric, uh, the cost of electricity needs to be reduced by 50% to make it uh, competitive in the existing markets, all right? So uh, those, uh, uh, those challenges can be overcome by uh, subsidies, uh, uh, investments, and then uh, as production gets scaled up and uh, many of the other panelists and, and the other panelists have said, uh, the cost of um, uh, electrolyzers will go down. And with renewable energy, we've seen the cost go down over the uh, years that my partners have been involved with uh, uh, wind power. So um, uh, those are the type of investments to de-risk uh, the, uh, the projects. Does that answer your question? Yes, and just can you mention the 
the need for water. Um, uh, water is important uh, in this space too. Obviously, uh, indigenous <clears throat> communities have uh, rights over water. You know, how does that play? Yeah, we, it, it'll take about nine tons of water to produce one ton of hydrogen. Um, we're very concerned about that. And uh, when, we, when we locate our plants, um, uh, we tend to know where the, uh, the water sources are. Um, and that comes from being on the land. And it's important that we don't overdraw on the water. So that's why we tend to lean towards a smaller plant. We imagine these huge plants, these gigawatt plants, where are you going to get all this fresh water from? You get, there's some research uh, for uh, using uh, uh, salt water, seawater, but um, uh, we like the idea of uh, a smaller plant where we can locate it within uh, an aquifer that uh, uh, can supply the needed amount of water. Yeah, the water is a major concern for us. Thank you. Uh, there's lots of challenges, obviously. Um, Ambassador Spawasa, I wondered if we didn't hear from you at the beginning. I wondered if you just had any reflections at this point um, uh, on what you've heard. Uh, uh, or, or whether you wanted to add anything, would you need to stop at the top of the hour or perhaps not? So I'm so sorry, we had a real Wi-Fi problem. Uh, everything has been said by the minister, by Dr. Kaufmann and um, by Raffaele really. Canada and Germany should be perfect partners in the production and um, sort of the scaling up of green hydrogen. Uh, this is a race now. And I think uh, we need to get going. We need to get going fast. And I'm very, very cheered by hearing uh, from everybody that they're getting ready to get started. Thank you. We've got one minute left per, per panelist. And I'd just like to, you know, to have your final reflections on whether we have the options not to develop hydrogen and what, what would you most like to see? If you could have your wish to, to move things forward fast, what would, what would you wish for? And I think, uh, well, I, I think we just, uh, you know, people moved around. Stefan, if we start with you, what, what, what are you ch channeling or targeting? Yes, I would like to have uh, Canada as a really strong partner for our climate, uh, global climate uh, goals and uh, the commitment of the government and also the uh, expected, uh, expected strategy will be helpful to work together also on the demand side, but also on the, on the, on the supply side. So maybe uh, to build up some, um, some import partnerships from green hydrogen from Canada, because you have better uh, conditions uh, to produce green hydrogen than, than, um, than Germany. And uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. And uh, hopefully I will come to Canada next year to talk about closer corporations. And uh, thank you very much for inv inviting me to this panel. Thank you for being with us from Namibia and good luck. We Another time we'll talk about the developing country role um, in that and how we can help uh, the technology become affordable in, in those kinds of places. Uh, Sarah, what about you? So, I mean, sure, we always have the option of not developing something, right? There are other technologies that we could use other than hydrogen to abate the toughest third of em emissions. You know, electrification could come into role in certain places. There's also other technologies like carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, and so, you know, again, I kind of just go back to uh, where's the opportunity for Canada? Is Canada uniquely positioned? We are on hydrogen. Uh, does it make sense from both an environmental and economic perspective? And in certain instances in this country, it does. And so I think hydrogen is an interesting uh, and important opportunity for Canada if done correctly. Thank you. I mean, obviously the one issue we haven't talked about today is the, the continuing subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and the lack of carbon pricing, which would help uh, create the markets um, for green hydrogen, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Raffaele, your final thoughts. Um, to, to make green hydrogen, you need lots of renewables and uh, that's uh, uh, no regret strategy. Even if you electrify more, you will still need a lot of renewables. So uh, all countries talking hydrogen should always remind it's about building up massive amounts of renewables whatever you have, wind, solar, hydro, whatever you have, geothermal. Thank you, and I absolutely agree with that. And the fact, as I said, that there's a symbiotic relationship between hydrogen and renewables does 
seem to make you feel that the two will go uh, uh, hand in hand in this space. Last word to you, Beaver. Yeah, and uh, here in Canada, uh, we uh, are looking at uh, Indigenous communities, uh, often uh, isolated and remote. And we, um, we believe the Crown is duty bound to assist us uh, to ensure our food security, our energy security in our communities. And that will lead to all this other uh, activity in, uh, in uh, community well being. So uh, we look to the Crown and, uh, and working with uh, uh, partners to solve these challenges. Thank you uh, to all the panelists uh, for being with us today for a really rich discussion. Thank you to everyone who's joined us, all the many participants, and for the very uh, vibrant Q&A and chat window that's been going on. We will uh, endeavor to answer some of those questions uh, offline um, and are collecting ideas. Um, we're always thankful to, to our sponsors, the, uh, the Embassy of, of Germany and the other sponsors you see here. We will be back in two weeks time. We're back to the Wednesday date for our final session in, in this area, um, which is around the green retrofits, the building retrofits, which is a key issue for us. Now I would like to pass on to, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I should say thank you to the minister who left, but it was a really upbeat start of the conversation. Um, and we're really looking forward to that hydrogen strategy emerging. And I'm gonna now hand over the session to Frederick Bone who's the MC for the plug and play, the more practical side of this, this session today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, and thank you also uh, to Corporate Knights, of course, uh, for making this possible and inviting us and to all the panelists for such an enlightening discussion and event thus far. Um, my name is Frederick Bohn. I'm the director of Corporate Partnerships for Plug and Play Supply Chain. And I have the pleasure today to MC the second half of this green hydrogen event. We have four amazing startups from Germany, Canada, and the United States. So representing a truly global lineup uh, and they're looking to define the hydrogen economy uh, for years to come. And before we get started, uh, I would also like to thank Marcelo Lu uh, for making this possible uh, and inviting us uh, to this event. Uh, we truly appreciate uh, your partnership. And I myself as a German couldn't be happier in playing such a part in growing and promoting the green hydrogen community through this format. Now, to kick things off, uh, I would like to invite Fazin Shatpur, Vice President at Plug and Play and Managing Director of the Supply Chain Program to this virtual stage. Um, Fazin, please take it from here. Great, thank you, Frederick. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for giving us a couple of hours of your precious day today to, to work on this very important uh, subject of hydrogen, which I think will be a larger part of our lives in the next decade or so. By way of introduction, my name is Farzin Shatpur. I'm a member of the executive committee and a vice president at Plug and Play. For those of you who are not familiar with our firm, Plug and Play is the world's most active venture capital firm, investing in over 250 startups per year. We are the largest accelerator in the world, operating more than 50 accelerator programs globally and we are the largest corporate innovation platform partnering with over 400 of the global fortune 2000 including most of the fortune 10 including many great uh, corporations that are based in canada or operate in canada such as basf and canada post we have been looking at the subject of hydrogen and at hydrogen startups uh, for over a year now and uh, we have learned some things that I would like to share with you today uh, during the quick few minutes that we have. Uh, we have uh, identified three categories that the startups are uh, working on and tackling. The first one being generation of hydrogen. As we heard uh, during the great panel discussion in the past hour, uh, all of this will be built on the great foundation of having a generation technology that can help us generate hydrogen in a green manner with a very low environmental impact. Otherwise, we will not meet our goals and we will not have the benefits of this technology. The startups that are working on this area, they have very diverse approaches. Some of them are looking at generation technologies that produce hydrogen at a very small scale. They could be potentially 
co-located, uh, let's say, next to a fueling station in the future. And some of them are uh, all the way on the other side of the, <clears throat> of the spectrum and working on uh, essentially producing hydrogen uh, and generating it at a very, very grand scale. So it's great that we have the minister on this uh, call and perhaps they can take advantage of the backing of the government. The second group of startups that we have identified are the ones who are working on the transportation of the hydrogen. So as again, we heard on the panel, it's important to have solutions to economically and safely uh, transport the hydrogen. Again, in this area, there are different startups that are having different approaches and different focus areas. Some of them are working on transport of hydrogen between cities, and some of them are working it at, again, a larger scale and perhaps transporting it across oceans and continents the same way that we now have uh, supply chain systems with our fossil fuels. The third uh, group of startups that we have been looking at are the ones who are working on the application of hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells on powering either our plants, our manufacturing plants, chemical plants and uh, operations, and the ones that are working on fueling the future of logistics, whether it be trucking, trains, planes, or ships. Uh, on the area of uh, fueling trucking, there are many that are making very good progress. Uh, these guys uh, have different approaches. Some of them are working on completely clean sheet designs that are building the truck from the ground up around the hydrogen fuel cell. There's a second category that is working on a hydrogen fuel cell kits that can be swapped out with the current uh, diesel drivetrain that is uh, existing in our current fleets. And then there is even a third category that is working on modifying the current diesel drivetrain to turn it into a hydrogen fuel cell, perhaps uh, the most economic approach that we will see if it works or not. Uh, I thought I would also share this infographic with you of the startups that uh, are in this area that we are looking at. Uh, again, unfortunately, we don't have time to go over all of them. We will hear from four of them today. And if you would like to uh, focus deeper in this area and have a further conversation, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself and my team. We'll be glad to go over it with you. Thank you again for your time today and back to you, Frederick. Thank you, Fazim, for this overview. Next up, I'd like to welcome Marcel Alou for some opening remarks from BSF. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I, I thank again the ambassador and uh, corporate knights uh, for putting this together. Very interesting discussion so far on policy and what countries are doing. Uh, very excited to host this also with plug and play and get to some practical examples of what can be done almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, just a short word on why BSF is uh, partnering with Plug and Play, especially here in Canada. I mean, I think it's quite obvious that uh, we as a big company, we also want to hear from the outside. We need the startup, uh, let's say, ecosystem to give us some agility and also to disrupt some of the discussions we have internally. But I think uh, even more important is the interaction with customers and what we allow our Canadian customers to have access also to the startups. But we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about the next slide, which is uh, uh, really on the, on the hydrogen space, uh, a space that Canada has everything to lead, uh, uh, be it on the green, blue, turquoise, uh, uh, gray hydrogen. I think there is a lot of opportunity here in Canada. Yeah? So if I go to the next slide, what I would like to do is uh, uh, really just uh, level set. I think there, were, there are a lot of forecasts out there which are hockey sticks or even exponential growth of uh, hydrogen demand. But I want to look back. And here you can see clearly that the hydrogen, most of its use uh, it has been in the refining step, it has been in ammonia, which goes into fertilizers and also industrial application. And the other is really just a small fraction up to this point. Yeah? Uh, so, so if you think about how this green bar needs to increase a lot when we put mobility, when we put power or energy to generation for buildings, uh, you can imagine uh, that you know the, the gap is much bigger to get there. And I think all the panelists before have talked about a lot of the um, infrastructure challenges and investment costs that are needed for this. If you go to the next slide. Uh, uh, here is something, just a quick example before we get to the startups. 
is something that BSF is looking at. And we are, of course, part of that industrial application of hydrogen, which is the majority of the application at the moment, right? Uh, and when we talk about state-of-the-art steam reforming of natural gas, which is the current blue hydrogen, uh, uh, if you will, there is an emission associated with this, and also there is a minimal energy demand that is associated with this. When you get into water electrolysis, you get into this more of this green hydrogen discussion. But then uh, I think it was already mentioned uh, very much so. I mean, water being a dead molecule, you need a lot of energy to get to the hydrogen. Yeah? And, and if that energy that you're using, a lot of it is not, a, is not little, uh, is not from a renewable source, uh, you actually are not meeting a, 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 on a full scale, a, a net zero uh, production of hydrogen. I think also Beaver Paul uh, mentioned about the water challenge or how much water you need to use to produce that hydrogen. So that is there. The second option here, which is methane paralysis, is something that BSF is working on. And as you can see here, there is a possibility to do it with direct uh, zero uh, CO2 emissions, but also address the emissions on the energy need. Uh, and that I go uh, in the next slide. So, so here you see very quickly uh, something that we have with in cooperation with the uh, German government uh, here with the Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research, some other universities and also institutions uh, started a, a lab process uh, in 2010. So before uh, hydrogen uh, was as sexy as it is now, we were already looking into this, into methane paralysis route. And what it is, is basically you take methane uh, you energize it and you, you will get uh, hydrogen, but also you get a pure, uh, uh, um, uh, pure carbon, a very, very high purity carbon. Yeah? So, so th this allows you to emit zero uh, emissions during the process, but you do have this byproduct, which is the pure carbon, and you get very, very clean uh, hydrogen out of this. Now, the challenge is with this byproduct, what can you do with this? And if you go to the next slide, uh, these are just some of the ideas that we have uh, not limited to this. And we are very open to partner uh, uh, with anybody that is having an idea on what to do with this uh, pure carbon. But there are immediate uses that you can do anywhere from soil improvement to, to producing uh, aluminum and steel from this pure carbon and hence also uh, closing the loop, if you will. So there are many uh, other applications as far as uh, energy storage, and all these kind of applications. But that is just something that BSF is working on. I, I think it's great that we have four startups that are uh, ranging from uh, storage and uh, logistics, and I look forward to having the discussion with them. So back to you, Frederick. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, and please don't go too far, as we do need you for the startup Q&A. Now uh, to the startup pitches for the day. As mentioned, we have an international lineup with two German, one Canadian and one American startup sharing more about their technologies with us today. And to kick things off, we will hear from Hydrogenius, a Bavarian startup giving you a sustainable and safe alternative to compressed or liquefied hydrogen storage through the LOHC technology. Ralph, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me perfectly well. Yes, so you can. Perfect, thank you very much. So good morning, good evening to everybody. I'm very happy to be able to present to you Hydrogenius and our LOHC technologies, which is liquid organic hydrogen carriers in order to have a safe and cost-efficient transport and storage of hydrogen in order to get the energy transition done. So uh, just very briefly, let, let me uh, say what you already discussed we will see a rise in the demand for hydrogen all over the world. And especially for Germany, we say more than 50% of the um, need or the demand of hydrogen must be imported. So we need large scale hydrogen import because we don't have the production capacities, capacities in Germany to get a full decarbonized energy system. And if we go to the next slide, we ask ourselves, of course, where does it come from? And we see, as you already discussed, Hydrogen can be, or green hydrogen can be um, produced cheaper in countries where you have an abundance 
of um, renewable energy resources. Here it's for solar energy by the IEA uh, done. So you have really um, differences between the cost of hydrogen in some countries and in other countries. So you have a gap and these cost differences in the future hydrogen production will define the sourcing strategies and global distribu distribution of a global hydrogen market. And that's where our technology steps in. And if you go to the next slide, let me com comment on our technology. What are we doing? What is Hydrogenius or the yellow HC technology of us? First of all, you have on the left side, the renewable energies or the hydrogen source, the electrolyzer or um, uh, the other technologies which, which are or will come to the market. I'm quite sure that we will see many innovations. And then comes our technology into play. We store or the um, hydrogen into a liquid organic hydrogen carrier uh, with our hydrogenation plant, the storage plant. This is an exothermic uh, process. So we get heat out, then store the hydrogen in a liquid, transport it via train, truck, or vessel to the release plant or release box. So, so to the end customer, very easily, it might be a huge hub, uh, industrial hub, harbor, or a very, very small refueling station. We can transport it uh, wherever we want to very safely. There we have an endothermic process. We have to put heat, heat in. And then we had transport uh, the, the LOHC back to the storage plant and go in a circle economy round and round and, and bring the hydrogen to every customer we want to. So what are the advantages of our technology? It's non-explosive. It is a commercial heat, heat transfer oil, actually our LOHC. Um, it's a diesel-like liquid. It's hardly flammable, so it's very, very secure to tr transport. If you don't have any problems like with ammonia or with hydrogen, you know from today, and it's stored at ambient condition and very, very cost efficient. And now I brought with me something in my home. I got two children, so they shouldn't bath in it. But this is one kilogram of hydrogen in here and 16 kilogram of LOHC. So quite easily, I can uh, walk around like with a diesel. Actually, our LOHC technology or the liquid is a little bit more safe than a diesel, but it's, it's very easy to transport it, very cost efficient in, in comparison to other technologies, uh, for especially those we already know. And if you go to the next slide, what are the applications of LHC and why does, is it a game changer? So first of all, we can now um, pro transport really large, huge volumes of LOHC, uh, of LOHC or of hydrogen via vessel. Uh, very, what you see of 17,000 tons of hydrogen is uh, in the future possible, but also with the small vessels here in Europe used on the blue, on the Danube River or the Rhine River, uh, 100 tons, 112 tons of hydrogen. The same with a train or by truck. And especially we can transport it with other goods. We can use existing infrastructure. We have the available of a complete different routes. We don't have a, just a pipeline system from A to B but we can uh, um, connect to our LOHC route, uh, many, many customers and also sources. And um, that's the low CAPEX also in comparison to other um, technologies like liquefied hydrogen or pipeline systems. And if you go to the next slide, uh, just a very brief also a comparison of LOHC to other technologies. I want, don't want to go into detail because every technology will have its place and uh, some technologies uh, are quite mature, for example, the compressed gas and um, the grid bound transportation, if you have ex existing pipelines, but in terms of flexibility for the future and safety and also implementability for our um, technology, I think there aren't as many options as, as we do have today. And of course, we have to research, we have to further invest in our technology, but we are quite sure that we will reach a certain level in the next uh, few years, very briefly in the near future, uh, in order to make this happen. And if you go to the next slide, uh, just very briefly, we were founded in 2013. It's a university spin-off. And now we are in 2020. Last year, we got very big uh, investors who are working already in the existing oil and chemical industry in the infrastructure um, system. And now we are planning actually in the future, 
So we are now at 100 employees. And if you go to the next and last slide, um, to the future of us is to establish a European LOG backbone in the near future. And this is not just um, some research we are doing. No, we have actually partners like Verbund, one of the biggest um, energy or utility companies in the Austria. We have one of the major gas companies in Spain. And uh, to connect Europe from east to west, west to east, and bring the hydrogen to Germany via, for example, vessel or a train or to, through the river Blue Danube, uh, the river Danube, um, and in the end have a, re a real backbone where we can connect every customer we want to the hydrogen um, backbone of LOHC. And that's a very, very brief um, description of our company, and I'm really happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. And now for the Q&A, Marcelo, back to you. Thank you, Frederick. So thanks, Ralph. Uh, really appreciate the presentation here. And uh, I think um, in a country like Canada, which already uh, has a lot of this uh, infrastructure that I think you are referring to, uh, uh, that may be a, a, an interesting thing to investigate further. But uh, um, just, just give us a little bit more um, information on, on what is your medium. Uh, from my understanding, is an aromatic uh, benzene toluene. Is that correct, or, or are you flexible to use some other medium as well? Yeah. Well, actually, right now we are using benzyl toluene uh, or di dibenzyl toluene, exactly, because uh, it has very good um, characteristics regarding safety and flexibility. Not flammable. Very good viscosity, so you can uh, use it as you are used with the um, current chemical and oil industry, and you don't have to uh, set up a security standards like you have with ammonia or huge uh, infrastructures like for liquid hydrogen. And that's why we are using benzyl toluene. But there's, uh, for example, another, let's say, um, startup or competitor from Japan. They are using toluene, which has the advantage that it's already a, a quite a cheap good in the, in, uh, in the world, toluene, but has very actually um, difficult uh, characteristics regarding safety and reliability and so on. And that's why we use benzyl toluene, which actually is produced by an American company in Germany. So it's a, it's, a, a, it's a good way which you can produce quite easily if you have the um, production site close by. And we do have this here in Germany. And that's why we chose uh, this um, LOHC or liquid uh, organic a hydrogen carrier. So, so another question that is popping up here is, uh, is, it this, is this a drop-in solution? You don't have to change any of the current infrastructures that one would have uh, when you're talking about shipment in, uh, in, uh, in, in ships, uh, in, in uh, trucks. Uh, uh, how, how do you see this? Uh, is there any conversion cost to do this? Uh, now it depends, uh, actually. So we looked a lot into this. Um, for example, the, the trucks, we, we have to, um, in order to make it more cost efficient for us, for our technology, we have, have slight, um, slight changes to do, but not on the cost side, but just um, to have five, six different compartments so we can fill in loaded LOHC and directly, or, and directly pump out unloaded LOHC. So something like that. But for example, storage tanks, we can use whatever there is. Um, we just have to clean them actually, so that our um, LOHC doesn't get uh, <laughs> uh, damaged or, or something like that. But yeah, in the end, um, most of the existing infrastructure uh, will be able, we will be able to use. But of course, we have to do some uh, minor changes to it. And maybe the final question is: What is the uh, energy loss? Uh, you know, putting you know, the hydrogen into the your medium and then taking it out. Yeah. So. If we get uh, if we put hydrogen into the LOHC, so we get out about nine kilowatt hours um, of heat per kilogram. And if we want to dehydrogenate it, so get the hydrogen out, we have to pin, put in twelve kilowatt hours of uh, heat, uh, twelve kilowatt hours of heat per kilogram hydrogen. So more or less, it's three kilowatt hours of heat which we lose. And this, of course, is about ten percent of the uh, value of uh, energy of hydrogen per kilogram, so 10% more or less. And additionally, of course, there are some minor electrical um, uh, demand, for example, for pump or for the transport, of course. 
Got it. And and uh, I think in a previous discussion we had, uh, you mentioned that you can keep reusing the medium, right? So it's not something exactly. you do, so you can keep reusing. Exactly. Okay, very exactly. good. Yeah. yeah, super rough. I appreciate it. And um, uh, thanks again. And, and back to you, Frederick. Thank, Thank you, Marcelo. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ralph. Um, up next, we will hear from Hydrogen in Motion, a startup from Vancouver, uh, talk about their basketball-sized fuel cell and how solid-state storage can increase efficiency and decrease cost all at the same time. Grace, please take it from here. Thank you, um, everyone, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, Plug and Play for inviting us to this uh, very interesting uh, discussion and Marcelo for, uh, for being uh, the host. Um, hydrogen motion, what we've developed is a nanomaterial that stores uh, hydrogen at uh, very low pressures at 50 bar instead of 700 bar and very high density at five weight percent, which is equivalent to uh, the highest um, high pressure tank on the market right now. Next slide. So um, I, I didn't uh, talk about where we're located in the big plan because uh, we really have five minutes, but uh, just to give you an idea of the people listening, what, what is the issue? Why do you need hydrogen storage? Um, uh, you know, hydrogen technology has been around for 40 years. Ballard uh, just celebrated the 40th uh, anniversary last year. And uh, why are we not having hydrogen phones in our pocket and everyone driving a hydrogen vehicle? And the issue is that uh, the entire economy is held back due to high costs that are hidden in the system. And um, as we saw from the hygienous uh, discussion previously, uh, hydrogen storage is actually a big issue in distribution. So it's very expensive to, uh, to store hydrogen. Um, these tanks uh, on, on the picture to the left is a um, Toyota Miride um, upside down and that yellow uh, thing is one of the three tanks uh, that's embedded in this car. Uh, it's really, um, the volume is about the size of a, a regular bathtub and they're very expensive. So it's, um, uh, a, car it's a carbon fi fiber tank at 700 bar and a very inefficient. So the second uh, issue really in the economy is that the supply chain. So uh, refueling hydrogen, there's not a lot of hydrogen stations right now, they're very, very expensive to install, about $2 million a pump, and they have very high OPEX because of the uh, 700 bar. You need a four-stage compressor and a chiller, which uh, are prone to failure. Next slide, please. So this brings us to uh, hydrogen motions technology. What we have developed is absorbent material um, that uh, using a small amount of pressure, 50 bar, which is uh, equivalent to uh, just higher than a propane tank, um, we can store the hydrogen in uh, a tank of any shape and size. So we can go from, if you look to the right, uh, a small scale uh, tank for UAVs and drones. We can make a swappable tank about the size of a basketball that holds one kilogram of hydrogen for vehicles, for um, heavy duty vehicles. We can make a larger tank for trains, uh, planes, automobiles, any application. And then of course, uh, we can, uh, our storage uh, solutions can be used for large scale uh, storage and distribution of, of hydrogen, whether it be um, on the back of shipping container on trains or uh, via uh, trucks. So our, our real value added is um, we can reduce the capex of the cost of the tank. So we can help ex um, users expand the markets and we can reduce the OPEX by simplifying the refueling. Um, and that is re uh, resulting in lower cost. So we can make the hydrogen value chain um, uh, cost effective and profitable for everyone in the supply chain. So when you make hydrogen, you need a tank. When you want to distribute and refuel, you'll need a tank. And when you uh, use any kind of fuel cell application, um, of course, you'll need a tank to hold the hydrogen. So we are fit in every piece of the backbone. 
The great thing about our technology also is that these tanks can be used to uh, swap out into existing um, high pressure installations. So our tanks are volumetrically more dense than say a 700 bar tank or two thirds of the size of the cost, uh, the size and cheaper, of course. Um, what that brings value is for uh, long haul trucking, for uh, heavy duty applications who need more fuel on board, we can give um, uh, more fuel for the same footprint. Next slide, please. So uh, we foresee deploying the hydrogen technology in three, uh, three ways. As, as the minister said, um, it's a massive market. We, we project it to be uh, um, over a trillion plus market and we can use it in three ways. Um, one, we can distribute hydrogen. So there's 55, metric, uh, 55 million metric tons of hydrogen being generated annually. Um, but it's mostly at oil and gas installations as, as uh, has been previously mentioned. We can help move that out of uh, those locations to places where people are needing hydrogen, where the demand is. So we link supply and demand. Uh, hydrogen fuel cell applications, of course, you know, automotive light duty uh, vehicles is a $6 trillion market, 80 million new vehicles a year. And transportation represent 24% of GHG emissions uh, alone. So impacting transportation will uh, significantly impact um, the, your GHG emissions. So for example, just to give you uh, a tangible um, insight into the market. Hyundai has, the chairman of Hyundai has um, committed to releasing 700,000 new fuel cells a year by 2030, which is uh, 10 years from now. For hydrogen motion, if those had a hydrogen, had a hydrogen motion tank, those 700,000 units, that would represent an $8 billion revenue opportunity for H2M, one company alone. An aerospace, um, the UAV market is estimated to be a $127 billion market. So there's very many markets and, and uh, we could go on and on about the ways our tanks could be used. The last one is very interesting in the sense that stored hydrogen is stored energy. So um, as our earlier speaker had mentioned that, you know, we can store um, uh, curtailed energy as, as uh, hydrogen using electrolysis. And that's a three to $5 billion opportunity of energy that's currently being lost. Next slide. That's it for uh, our presentation. I just want to give you an idea of what we can do and uh, the market opportunity. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're at in terms of TRL level, we're just moving uh, from lab scale to commercialization uh, this year. Last year we were spent, uh, and 2020 we were spent in upscaling our material. We believe we'll be ready for commercialization by 2021. So if you're interested in knowing more about us, feel free to contact me on those details below. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Grace. And now back to Marcelo for the Q&A. Thanks, Frederick, and thanks, Grace. Uh, um, great to hear from a Canadian company. Uh, yeah, uh, we just heard from uh, a German one and now a Canadian one. And one of the, uh, I mean, you already mentioned on the upscaling, and I think he, your call is uh, you, you're ready to go. Yeah, as far as uh, the next year. Uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask, uh, and I'll start with the last question that I made to uh, uh, Rolf is uh, um, what is the energy loss? Uh, uh, do you experience any energy loss or any hydrogen loss when you're uh, storing and then uh, taking it out from your um, uh, capsules? Uh, no, we do not foresee having any energy loss. I mean, um, the we've calculated out is 0 0.01 um, EV uh, per kilogram of uh, hydrogen. So the, um, the kinetic energy is extremely small. Yeah, and, and what purity level do you need the hydrogen to be, uh, uh, to be you know, stored? It will be the same uh, purity as um, for fuel cells, so five nines. Okay, 
and, and when you're talking about uh, uh, storage, you're able to reuse these capsules how many times before you need to do maintenance? We have an estimated life cycle of 7,000 cycles, uh, which is uh, 20 years um, or, or longer. Um, there will be a regular maintenance on these uh, tanks that require purging and refreshing, uh, but it will be uh, 10 times the life cycle of a lithium ion battery. So should, people should be happy about that. <laughs> Very good. And, and, and if you're thinking about lo logistics, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, something that is very interesting. I mean, you can replace tanks, but you can also, uh, you know, uh, close the gap on even road logistics or rail logistics with these capsules. I mean, how, how big can they be and how small? Uh, uh, can you give, uh, um, you know, some uh, um, uh, view on the challenge on the engineering of, of upscaling this to a very big tank size or is, or a small capsule that goes into a drone I saw in your picture? Well, um, the great thing about what we have is uh, the magic is in the nanomaterial that we make. And um, so size of the tank is, um, it, it, there, there's very few limitations. We don't need to wrap the tank in carbon fiber the way you do with high pressure tank. Uh, we can use a, a standard class three, class four tank um, that are already existing and uh, just put our powder in with a, with a micron filter uh, and it's ready to go plug and play. So we can make a custom size tank or we can just use a standard off the shelf tanks. So we have a lot of flexibility on, on how we can deploy this technology. And I don't know if you're able to answer this question, but it's popping up here. What is the material type? Uh, uh, metal organic framework or interstitial? I, I wouldn't know <laughs> what that is, but uh, maybe. I, I love that there's some very technical people on, on the call. Well, um, it, is, it is not a moth. The uh, metal organic frameworks are absorbent material. Um, the Max Planck Institute has been leading the charge on this for many years. So Germany has always been at the center of trying to uh, get a absorbent material out to market. Um, we have, uh, luckily Canada has been the pioneer uh, once again, and we have uh, produced the absorbent material that is not a moth. So um, it, it has similar in principle, uh, theoretical um, uh, ideas in the sense that it's absorbent rather than using a metal hydride or chemically uh, storing hydrogen the way, the way LOHC does, we, we have it um, just bonded very lightly to the surface like you have uh, water in a sponge, you squeeze the sponge and the water pops out. Uh, that's the same with the, our material, the, the release of the pressure is enough to release the hydrogen from the surface to the material. So it's very lightly, it's like surface tension, it's very lightly bonded. I see also there's a question on toxicity. And, and I think that was for the for Rao, but uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, actually, uh, I would uh, encourage you, Grace, and also Ralph, to answer any of the questions here. I think there are a couple popping up, uh, uh, but uh, I think we need to leave it there. Grace, uh, uh, great to talk to you, and I, uh, I hope we, we get a chance to talk again. I don't hope, I think we will. Uh, uh, so we leave it at that. Frederick, back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Marcelo. For the third startup, uh, we are going back to Bavaria, Germany, and we'll be hearing from KiU, a startup reinventing the internal combustion engine to achieve sustainable zero emissions in the mobility sector. Robin, welcome on stage. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good afternoon, dear people from Canada. Good evening to everyone listening from Europe. Um, thank you for being here. Um, can you please go one slide further? So currently, all over the world, but also in Germany and North America, um, the OEMs uh, are dealing with the problem of having to come up with zero emission solutions within the next decades. Um, otherwise, they are ha facing heavy fines. Um, please one further. Currently in the European Union, we do have three designated solutions. That is, I think many people know the battery electric vehicles as well as the fuel cell vehicles. And now we come in with the hydrogen combustion engine. Um, the next slide, I will show you. Um, so I can go one further. 
Yes. Um, so what Q did is uh, we um, invented a modular kit to convert uh, co uh, diesel engines to hydrogen combustion engines. As you can see on the picture, there's additional uh, components which are colored blue, which are coming from from us. And this way, any manufacturer of engines can convert the existing diesel or gas engines uh, to a zero emission hydrogen engine. Our kit is manufacturer independent. That means we can work with every manufacturer. They apply to all sizes and uh, they are very fast in, uh, in the integration. So we are market ready in a very short period of time. Please one further. So our uh, business model actually uh, takes into account that there's uh, already an existing automotive industry. Um, what we find charming is that we don't have to build uh, a new uh, infrastructure to um, produce our, um, our solution. So what we are doing is we are giving the OEM's engineering service, services, that means that we are converting the engines. And the next step, can you please go one further? Okay, then please go one back. I think the slides are mixed up. Um, additionally, what you don't see here is that we are taking into account uh, a component business. That means that we are working together with tier one suppliers um, with uh, which are producing our components according to our design so that we are selling a turnkey solution to the OEMs. Now we can go one slide further, please. We have not invented the wheel new. Um, there has been a, a hydrogen combustion engine already on the market in 2006, for example, by MIN. Um, what is our innovation leap is that we were able to increase the power per displacement by a great deal while actually reducing the consumption by half. So that actually the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, the operation of these vehicles is now a business case also for the operator. One further, please. Um, these are our emissions, uh, our emissions. So we do have uh, emissions, uh, even though I'm calling us uh, zero emission uh, technology. This is why, because we are defined as zero emission technology according to EU law when it comes to CO2. Uh, we have very small CO2 emissions. That's due to the lubricants and the combustion engines. We also have uh, NOx, which is uh, one of the bad uh, uh, emissions from diesel engines. However, we are already without exhaust after treatment uh, uh, tenfold below the current limits. Uh, additionally, we have an SCR cut developed to reduce the NOx emissions even further. One further, please. So this is our TCO. I was talking about that uh, the operator that makes sense for the operator to um, uh, to um, op yeah uh, to operate our engines. Um, so, uh, we, sorry, I'm a bit mixed up because uh, the slides are coming in a different order. Um, we are slightly more expensive than uh, the current uh, diesel technology for the operator. At the same time, we are as uh, reliable uh, as normal combustion engines, and they can be fixed as normal uh, combustion engines so that the maintenance infrastructure of the operators can stay the same. One further, please. This is the same. Okay, one further, please. Okay, currently we are already um, working together with uh, four, uh, three uh, engine manufacturers. One of them is Deutz. They were the early starters who are working with us. Additionally, which I cannot disclose, we're working together with two more European manufacturers in the commercial vehicle uh, industry. And we're uh, talking to one more Asian manufacturer where, the, uh, where we are preparing another project of engines. One further, please. Additionally, we want to give some demonstration projects. We are no vehicle manufacturer, neither we are uh, engine manufacturers, but we want to show uh, our technology working on the street. On the right side, you can see an 18 ton truck as well as a 12 meter city bus. Uh, they are currently being set up together with, the with funds from the European Union, as well as funds from the Bavarian government. Additionally, we are starting next year with a 40 ton truck project and a coach for longer distances. Next slide, please. This, what you saw before, is the commercial vehicle market. This is our start and market entry, but we know there's combustion engines in many applications around the world. So this is where we want to go in the future. Next one, please. Uh, we have 
actually gotten some awards already. Um, we are very proud of it. Uh, the hydrogen combustion engine has been under the radar for several years. Um, and we believe, thanks to us, it's gone back into public. Uh, many automotive uh, producers are talking about it, as well as on some conferences. It's an idea that is being highly appreciated. Next one, please. So this is our team, um, our founders, they have been involved with BMW and also with the production of the uh, hydrogen combustion vehicles, the BMW 7, as well as our head of uh, engine development, Werner Prüm. He was uh, one of the leading engineers for the MIN bus, which are still running actually after more than 12 years on hydrogen. So we have gathered the German know-how on hydrogen combustion engines to put together into one company to get the topic up again. Next one, please. And that's the end. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions coming up. Thank you very much, Robin. Marcelo, you know the drill. Back to you for the Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Frederick. Uh, and thanks, Robin, again, uh, for a you know, very interesting uh, presentation, especially on dealing now. We've heard on how to move hydrogen, but now how to make use of it in a mobility uh, setting. And to your point, um, um, uh, really even in, in the heavy diesel uh, category, which is one that uh, um, there's a lot of pressure to convert. So, so a couple of questions uh, uh, coming in. Is it, is it only for diesel engines or it can be applied for other type of fuels? Mm. Uh, the reason why we moved to diesel uh, is that, uh, like I said, our founders have been involved in startups for the hydrogen combustion engine as well as BMW and uh, the passenger cars are actually already occupied by batteries. Um, also, um, the um, let's say the, the, the uh, infrastructure network is not uh, as high for hydrogen. And for the commercial vehicles, uh, we are targeting actually customers which are coming back to the depot at the end of the day. So the reason why we went for diesel is because uh, we uh, wanted to go into the commercial vehicle sector. Right. It is actually easier to convert a gas engine or a um, automotoric engine, such as a petrol engine, to hydrogen. But uh, they are not being used as much in the uh, commercial vehicle sector. So just because of a time, two questions, and you can uh, answer them uh, back to back. Uh, um, mm. One is uh, the investment amount, uh, uh, additional investment amount uh, to make these changes in the OEM level, if you have any sense of what that is. And then also, uh, I know you don't like the word retrofit. I remember this from our previous discussion, but a lot mm. of questions around, can you retrofit uh, current fleets, especially mm -hmm. if they're brand new ones that were just acquired, so they still have mm -hmm. a, a, a life cycle ahead of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me start with the first question. Um, I don't want to disclose any numbers, how expensive it is to convert an engine, um, but it is, uh, let's say, um, in a uh, six-digit six area. Um, that means it is uh, still a good deal for an uh, OEM because they, in order to develop a new engine, they put like 50 to 100 million euros on the table, whereas we convert this engine that has been already um, um, developed into a zero emission engine uh, with a much, much lower uh, investment. Um, coming now to the question of the retrofit for existing engines. Um, it is quite expensive, the project, to, to convert it. We are having three engines on the test bench. Of course, we have a learning curve. Of course, we want to decrease the cost in the future. And we are also currently investigating a retrofit case for existing engines. Um, but for the moment, since uh, we have to adjust our components to one single engine model, depending on the size and also on the manufacturer, because every engine is a bit different, um, we are currently uh, going into the new vehicle market. Uh, for existing engines, it might make sense, let's say if we have a fleet operator with uh, 50 to 100 um, uh, uh, vehicles, which are with the same engine, it would make sense economically to retrofit. But uh, it's a case by case decision. Very good. Thank you, Robin. Uh, back to you, Frederick. And uh, uh, please you. Keep, keep answering the uh, questions, Robin, in the chat here. Bye bye. We do. Awesome. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Robin, once more. Last but definitely not least, we have Proof Energy joining us live from Fremont, California to share more about their alternative to conventional fuel cells. Tim, the stage is yours. 
Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Dahmer. I'm the CEO of Proof Energy, and it's great to be with you here today. Uh, thanks in particular, of course, to BSF and, and Plug and Play. So I look forward to sharing uh, an overview of Proof Energy's breakthrough fuel cell technology and to the Q&A session after the presentation. Proof Energy is uh, targeting two large global markets, uh, the medium and heavy duty uh, electric powertrain market, as well as the stationary generation and combined heat and power CHP applications. Together, these, uh, these markets represent more than $150 billion a year of, of opportunity, uh, growing to more than $200 billion a year by 2024. And as we now hear in the media almost every day, the transformation of these markets is rapidly accelerating uh, through the work of companies like Tesla and Proterra and increasing government regulations around the world, uh, including places like India, where they're banning uh, diesel generators in big cities. Uh, and of course, here in California also, uh, with the recent mandate that half uh, of all heavy duty trucks uh, must be zero emissions by 2035. Next slide, please. So it's very clear that class three to class eight vehicles are starting to go electric from package delivery vehicles to city transit buses to long haul trucks. But there's a major problem. And that is that conventional technologies are just not cost effective for these medium and heavy duty EVs. Uh, most EVs today uh, use lithium ion battery packs, uh, but even with the latest improvements in performance and cost, uh, these packs typically represent more than 50% of the total cost of the vehicle. In addition, independent uh, estimates indicate that uh, a battery electric long haul truck with a 500 mile range requires 1400 kilowatt hours or more of battery storage weighing approximately seven tons and reducing the payload capacity of the vehicle by 30 to 50%. In addition, uh, conventional fuel cells also face significant cost, performance, and infrastructure issues. So now I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna solve this problem. So Proof Energy uh, is headquartered in Fremont, California and was founded in 2019 to commercialize breakthrough fuel cell technology developed at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And Proof Energy's power modules will revolutionize both the transportation and stationary power applications based on our optimum balance of performance and cost. Next slide, please. So Proof Energy is commercializing breakthrough metal supported solid oxide fuel cells. As you may know, solid oxide fuel cells are the highest efficiency of all fuel cells with efficiencies of over 60% for fuel to electricity and over 80% for fuel to energy. That's electricity plus heat combined. Our technology addresses the key issues that have faced uh, fuel cells up to this point. In particular, the stainless steel construction is 10x less expensive than ceramic supported cells. Uh, proof energy cells uh, are very strong, vibration resistant, and even impact, uh, impact tolerant. Uh, in addition, uh, our, our cells are fuel agnostic, uh, which means that we can absolutely use hydrogen as it becomes more available, more cost effective, and greener. But in addition, we can also use other low cost fuels that are readily available today. Uh, like ethanol or methanol or even ammonia. Uh, these fuels are hydrogen carrier fuels uh, with significantly higher energy densities than compressed hydrogen, which make them well suited for transportation application. Even more importantly, proof energy fuel cells are low cost. They're designed and uh, around a standard 50 kilowatt uh, scalable power module. They use low cost raw materials and simple manufacturing processes. And so the bottom line is that our fuel cells enable up to a 95% reduction in battery capacity and costs for medium and heavy duty EVs. And due to the low capital and operating costs, our systems also offer payback versus diesel engines uh, of just two and a half years. So a standalone business case, even without government subsidies. Next slide, please. Our leadership team has a unique and powerful mix of experience in both business and technology in vehicles and stationary applications, as well as both Fortune 100 companies and startups. And I'm also excited to announce that uh, we've recently signed definitive agreements for our $3 million Series A funding and kicked off our first strategic partnership. 
So we're now building out our new lab facilities here in Fremont, California, uh, together with our partner. And we have multiple additional partnerships uh, under discussion. So thanks for your time today. Please join us on our journey to eliminate uh, diesel engines, and diesel generators, and reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by up to 10%. Thanks a lot. I look forward to your questions, Marcel. Marcelo. Thank you, Tim. And one final time, Marcelo, back to you. Very good, uh, Tim. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, definitely last but not least, uh, very interesting. Uh, and, and really giving a full spectrum of all the technologies that are out there. A couple of questions that pop up here, uh, at least for me, uh, uh, where, and maybe I'll give the three questions just because of time and, and then you can uh, also see here in the chat. Uh, uh, where are you in the technology progress? I mean, you, you mentioned that you just raised uh, uh, the funding and uh, what is your com commercial next step? Yeah, when are you getting commercial? Uh, uh, one of the, uh, issues also in generators. Uh, I mean, um, uh, we, we have a lot of remote communities here in Canada. Other countries have it as well. Uh, I, I mean, logistically, I, I suppose uh, uh, this will be easy to put it there, but uh, how is it to do maintenance uh, once it's in a very remote location? And the last one is, uh, you mentioned that it's a metal. So what is the weight profile? Is Does it increase the weight of the vehicle and hence maybe uh, using more energy? So. I'll leave you with these three questions and uh, and then I think uh, Frederick will take over here, yeah? Very good, so thanks Marcelo. So those are great questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll try to answer each one of them fairly briefly. And uh, if we have time, we can, we can dive deep, deeper. So on the commercialization front, uh, the core technology itself, uh, based on the fundamental work that's been done at Lawrence Berkeley is actually well advanced and demonstrated and patented. Uh, what we're now doing is taking that uh, metal supported SOFC cell technology and packaging it into stacks and, and systems. And obviously one of the reasons that we're participating in this event today is that we're right in the mode of expanding our network of strategic partners, both from a supply chain perspective, as well as a customer and application perspective in both transportation and stationary applications. And we're targeting having first uh, demo systems in the field with those transportation and stationary partners in 2022. Uh, the second topic was around uh, remote locations and maintenance. Uh, this is, a, again, it's a great question, but also a great opportunity for this kind of technology. As a solid state technology uh, with almost no moving parts, uh, maintenance uh, requirements and costs are, are very limited. And I think when you combine that with the latest in uh, remote diagnostics and uh, IoT, uh, predictive maintenance capabilities and, and, and software, we actually think this is a really excellent opportunity to combine digital technologies with our solid state fuel cell technologies to provide uh, really great uh, solutions for applications like uh, cell tower backup power, et cetera. So we, we're actually embracing uh, these, these remote opportunities. And lastly, you asked about weight. Uh, at a simple level, if I look at a transportation application, uh, the 50 kilowatt standard power module that we're developing, conceptually is designed to be a drop-in replacement for a diesel engine, both in terms of footprint and in terms of overall size size and weight. So again, I'm trying to keep my answers brief, but happy to, to dive deeper on any of those or other, other topics. Very much appreciate the brevity, Tim. And thank you again for the presentation. Now, to wrap things up, I have the honor to welcome Said Amidi, Plug and Play's CEO and founder to the stage, Said. Please take it from here for some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Frederick. Uh, it has been a really exciting webinar. And I must say, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, co-hosting this with Corporate Knights and uh, Marcelo from BASF. Thank you so much. You know, this, uh, just to give you a little story, we had a visit from the board of directors of Mercedes about four and a half years ago. And after uh, they spent about four hours with us and looked at three startup and invested, I believe in two of them, the uh, Dr. Seche, the CEO of Mercedes at that time asked us, can you please come to Stuttgart and build the innovation platform for mobility? 
which is, you know, connected car, autonomous car. And, uh, you know, I mentioned to Dr. Seche that I have never been to Stuttgart. And within uh, six months, we started the program. It's called Startup Autobahn. And now I believe it is the best platform in the world in, you know, mobility and automotive industry. Other than Mercedes, then we invited Porsche Volkswagen to join the platform and many tier one suppliers like Bosch, Farsia, ZF. The, why I'm mentioning this uh, story is because when everybody collaborates together on the same, what I call open innovation platform, we could find the best technologies and work with large corporation and with investors to scale the business at a much faster pace. Nowadays, we do over 100 pilots per year in Stuttgart. And other than the automotive industry, we have had many corporations like BP, Shell, Germany join the program. And now with this real excitement of hydrogen, we would love to build the same innovation platform in Toronto, Canada and parts of Europe in Germany. So we can take this industry to a new levels. And just to summarize, we at plug and play, we are not an expert in every industry, but we are able to bring universities, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, corporations that are interested in the same technology and industry and being together we can accelerate the development and we are super excited to do this with hydrogen and uh, you know improving the different uh, you know sustainability efforts around the world again it was a fantastic webinar thank you for joining and thank you for having me be part of it thank you so much said that's a wrap Thank you to Corporate Knights. Thank you to Ambassador Sparwasser. Thank you to the minister. And thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you next time. Goodbye.